So as the cauldron closes in on Bakhmut, uh, Russians have a different name for it. Uh, you know, I'd just been kind of fishing around. I wasn't going to make a second video. Uh, by the way, Don Donetsky City uh, in, in um, the Donbass is being shelled by Ukraine. So they are having some success there. And then we did have some more Ukraine drone strikes in Crimea. So yeah, of course the Ukrainians are, are having some success. But, uh, you know, I've had people uh, putting comments on my channel and they're like, well, you know, this is insignificant. Russia's going to lose. Oh my God, there's no way that Russia can fight this war. Look at the GDP of Russia compared to other nations. Uh, they, they're not manufacturing anything. They, they can't put T-90 tanks on the front lines. Well, let me tell you right now, uh, the, uh, the amount of armor that uh, Russia is throwing up onto the front lines is uh, absolutely astounding. I've never seen manufacturing uh, take place in, in, in this. And when you consider that Russia has only, well, I mean, if you, if you want to believe the, uh, uh, the pundits out there or the people that they only have 3% of the GDP of the West, right? And they're going up against NATO. They're going up against the United States. Well, you know, I was trying to, you know, in my mind, you know, you got to kind of figure these things out. And uh, I, I knew their manufacturing capacity was, was far beyond what's ever been reported. Uh, it's far beyond our capacity. It's far beyond Russia, uh, Western capacity. Uh, why are we providing uh, Ukraine with heavy armor? Well, I think we're just trying to put up a defensive position so that Russia just doesn't overwhelm their defenses when the uh, when the offensive comes but this this is Alexander uh, Myokis on YouTube I don't want to steal from him too much I you know I'm not allowed to do that I can't you can't take too much content but he's just reading from uh, a, a, another author and I think I'm okay doing this I mean you know I'm, I'm still new to this whole YouTube video creation thing but this is the best explanation that I think that I have heard ever is to explain what's going on, why it's happening, and why Ukraine is going to lose. Now, a lot of people say, oh, they're not going to lose, they're not going to lose. Oh, no, no, the, the, the Russian hammer is going to be coming down here shortly, and this will explain why. And I just wanted you to hear this. Uh, I, I hope I'm not taking too much content from him, but it's an hour long video, so I'm only taking about five minutes here. So let's listen to this. And, but the points that I'm going to discuss, and I find them the most interesting in some ways in this interview, are specific ones about the economic situation. But uh, 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 Todd makes the point right at the outset of the interview that at least in the West, a lot of the publications spoke about um, a relatively easy Russian military victory in Ukraine, but they also assumed the rapid economic collapse of Russia. It now, in my previous video, I talked about how the sanctions uh, have backfired completely. Uh, actually, they're going against uh, Europe at this point. Um, so I kind of want you to understand that. And, uh, and this, this is an author, this Todd guy, I, don't, I, I haven't read it, I mean, I'm just listening to Alexander, uh, which I encourage you to watch his channel on YouTube. I always try to promote my sources. Um, but uh, let's, let's just continue to listen. But I did want to refer you back to my previous video where I talked about uh, how pitiful, well, actually, they've completely backfired. The sanctions are actually going against Europe and the United States at this point. They're not hurting Russia at all. Uh, and, and we're going to get the explanation of that. You're going to say, oh, that cybersecurity guy, you're just lying. You're, you're a lying animal. You, you don't know anything. Well, guess what? Shut up and listen. The face of Western sanctions. Now, I'm not going to discuss Todd's comments about military matters because straightforwardly, he's a civilian to the same extent that I am. And I doubt that he has anything really insightful to say. And see, that's the difference between me and, and Alexander. You know, I'm, I am a military animal, and I've studied history, and I've studied military, 
and I and I've served in the military 11 years. I've been to war and back. I fought many battles. So anyway, let, let's let's continue. So I do have the military perspective in my mind, uh, but I don't promote on that. You know, I'm not trying to boast or anything. All right, let's keep going. Is there um, on that sort of topic, but on economics and and economics is not my position of expertise. Uh, so this is this is why I found this so fascinating and I'm gonna just be quiet for a while I know it's hard for me to do I just want to pontificate pontificate that's what I like to do demographics he has in my opinion a strong record and he's clearly somebody who's written and thought about these things a great deal and he talks about the fact that the Russian economy has proved astonishingly resilient in ways that nobody expected in the face of US sanction, Western sanctions pressure. And he's asked a specific question, and I should stress, I'm taking this from a, a translation of Emmanuel Todd's interview, which was provided to me by a viewer, French-speaking viewer, in a private email. Again, I'm not going to identify who this person is, but I do want to take this opportunity to thank this person for this translation. And this is what Todd says. And the question was, many observers point out that G Russia has the GDP of S Spain. Aren't you overestimating its economic power and resilience? And this is what Todd says. War becomes a test of political economy. It is a great revealer. The GDP of Russia and Belarus is 3.3% of Western GDP, aggregate Western GDP, virtually nothing. One wonders how such an insignificant GDP can cope and continue to produce missiles. Well, then this is what I pointed out. I mean, Russia is a hugely commodity-rich nation, um, you know, and you're going to hear in the next coming moments where this GDP comes from, and it's all fluff. It's all fluff. All right, so let's keep going. The reason is the GDP is a fictional measure of production. If we take away from US GDP half of its overbuilt health expenditure, then the wealth produced, and he puts those. Kill all the lawyers! Kill all the lawyers! <laughs> Never mind. These words are in quotation marks by the activities of lawyers, by the most filled prisons in the world, by an economy of ill-defined services, including the production, again in inverted commas, of 15 to 20,000 economists with an average salary of $120,000. We realize that a significant part of this GDP, US GDP in other words, is water vapor, which brings us to the real economy. It makes it possible to understand what is the real wealth of nations, the capacity of production and therefore the capacity for war. If we... See, we have no capacity for production anymore. And uh, China and Russia, they have all the capacity for production. So, well... We're going to see where this whole thing plays out. That's why I call these videos watching the world burn, baby. Watching the world burn. Come back to material variables. We see the Russian economy in 2014 when we put in place the first major sanctions against Russia. It subsequently increased its wheat production from 40 to 90 million tons in 2020. Thanks to neoliberalism, U.S. wheat production has fallen between 1980 and 2020 from 80 million tons to 40 million tons. By the way, I, I, I cannot verify these figures. I'm just quoting Todd here. I he tend may to be believe right, the figures. He may be wrong about the precise figures, but about the trajectory. Mm. 
He's yeah. certainly right. Yeah. Russia has also that. become the leading exporter of nuclear power plants. Yeah, Ukraine is the, I mean, the uh, Russia is the number one producer of, of uh, uranium. Such a state of nuclear decay that the United States would have a first strike capability on a Russia that could not respond. Uh, no longer, that's not true. Not today. It's obviously different. Russia, therefore, has a real capacity to adapt. When we want to make fun, of centrally planned economies, we emphasize their rigidity, we glorify capitalism, we praise its flexibility. We are right. For an economy to flip be flexible, there must of course be the market, financial and monetary mechanisms. But first you need an active population that knows how to do things. The United States yeah, is more now more I mean, look at our youth. as Russia. We put two masks two on times in student Fachi. groups. Oh yeah, Fachi. We the gotta fact, love Fachi. Oh, the Fachi guy. That little Google. short troll, I hope he goes to jail. doing higher education. In the United States, 7% study engineering, whilst in Russia, it is 25%. Oh, look By at that, way, 25%. I believe that is correct. That means that with 2.2 times fewer people studying, Russia trains 30% more engineers than the United States. Yeah, that's for sure. The United States fills the gap with foreign students, but who are mainly Indians and even Chinese. This substitute resource is not safe and is already decreasing. This is the fundamental dilemma of the US economy. It can only face competition from China by importing skilled Chinese labor. I propose here the concept Oh, how about two million immigrants crossing the border? The Russian economy oh, that was a good idea. the rules of operation of the market. It is even an obsession of Putin to preserve them but with a very large role for the state. But it also just derives its flexibility from training engineers who allow the adaptions, industrial and military. Um, and he has more to say about this, that if... All right, if you want to watch the rest of that, just tune into Alexander uh, Mor Mayorkas on uh, YouTube. Uh, I'll try to put a link in this video uh, uh, down below. Well, I will uh, eventually, and you know, I only have so much time. Uh, but I thought this was the most uh, informative commentary on, uh, you know, a lot of people, they say, well, Russia, they can't survive the sanctions. Well, I already did a video on the sanctions. Uh, Russia, they can't survive military. Well, guess what? I mean, you know, so now I hope that this, this little teeny bit of video I uh, kind of brings out the reality of the situation. Um, you know, I, I don't see, uh, well, Bakhmut, I, I imagine within the next uh, month or so uh, will, will fall. I mean, I, from what I understand, the Ukraine is still continuing to try to rush in reinforcements and, uh, and refortify, but there's only one road left available, and so the Russian cauldron because there are some villages there. I was watching, you know, I didn't want to get into all the details. You can watch other people's videos uh, on, on the number of villages that Russia is attacking as they do this, this encirclement strategy. And I've talked about it many, 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 many times, uh, you know, that these, these are age-old, you know, military tactics that you can go back through history, you know, a million times. Uh, you know, what you do is you encircle your... Encircle your encircle your enemy cut off their supplies and then just well you can either wait them out or uh well in some idiot generals you know they'll throw uh troops needlessly into the cauldron and uh and and, and burn their troops against the defenses when really all you got to do is just wait for them to eat rats which is what the um, uh, uh union army did at vicksburg i mean that was a horrible situation because the confederates they were holding out they had the ammunition but the uh, Union troops just said, okay, well, just sit in there and, you know, we'll wait until you run out of food, you run out of everything. And see, that was another problem. They had the civilian population in there with them. I mean, if it had just been the troops, they probably could have held out a lot longer, you know. And then, and then they, you know, there's all kinds of things that enter into uh, military tactics, you know. Um, so, you know, uh, if you've got this massive army 
and you have to supply them and you have to, to, to fund them because they got to get paid and you got to do. So you, you want to employ that massive army sometimes as fast as possible, which means that you're going to grind down your troops uh, quickly. Or, you know, sometimes in a, you have, enter into a situation where you can just encircle a location, uh, leave a, a minimal force behind just, and just trap the people in that location and move on uh, because, um, you know, y y the expenditure of you having those troops sitting there is much less than funding your main army. So where I think the inflection point is coming in this war okay and this is what i'm telling you this is why i said the hammer's going to come down okay is is russia's entering the point where they've got 500 i don't know 600 000, if i've heard i you know i'm hearing crazy number maybe a million troops but no i don't think it's anywhere near that number but i mean but you've got this massive armada that's, that's just waiting on the the, the 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 back lines now they got to fund all that you know they got to pump all the resources in now what they're gonna what they want to do is make sure that they've got everything they need to fight okay and so that's kind of the position that we're in right now in the war so Russia's kind of funding everything into the this this military uh, force uh, which you know uh, for the uh, the Normandy invasion of uh, Ukraine let's just put it that way uh, but they can't let those troops sit there for an extremely long period of time because that's going to get to be too expensive on their on their resources. You just heard they got 3% of the GDP of the West, although you heard about what the GDP really is of the West. So, you know, it, it, you, you, as a general, you have to look and you got to see, okay, we've done enough, we're ready, we cannot afford to sit here any longer, and we have to launch the offensive uh, wherever it may go. And, uh, and so that's, that's kind of the, the, the inflection point that we're at. Um, so it should get uh, very, well, I mean, I, you know, I hope to God I don't eat a nuclear missile here in Florida, but uh, uh, we become part of the war. But, uh, you know, just sitting as an outsider, just kind of looking in, um, I find it fascinating because, I don't know, my mind is about military tactics and what's taking place and studying the whole thing. And under, now understanding a little bit about economics and, and everything that's taking place. Anyway, I didn't mean to make a, another long-winded, stupid video. Uh, it's good, good, good to live in the free, free Republican state of Florida under the great leadership of the Sanctimonious. <laughs> Thank God there's no leftoids that live in Florida. Well, there are a few, my ex-wife, but anyway.